To understand how infinity came to be included in mathematics, we need to appreciate the history of infinity in ancient Greece. Our story of infinity in ancient Greece stretches from Zeno's paradoxes through to Euclid's elements. For a disbeliever who totally rejects infinity, the ancient Greek hero should be Democritus for his real-world-based arguments against the concept of infinity. Zeno was trying to make the point that motion can't happen. He devised several philosophical arguments to show that continuous motion is nothing but an illusion. Many of his paradoxes showed that if both time and motion are continuous, it leads to contradiction. And many of his paradoxes are equivalent to considering a person's journey from A to B as consisting of infinitely many smaller journeys. For example, first they must have travelled half the distance, then half the remaining distance again, and if they keep going half the remaining distance, they would never be able to reach point B. We could even relate this scenario to 0.9 recurring by making the first journey to be 9 tenths of the remaining distance to point B. The next journey is again 9 tenths of the remaining distance. And so on, showing that this process can never reach 1. Zeno argued that we obviously can't do an infinite amount of journeys and that this showed the notion of movement must be wrong. Zeno also devised a paradox about an arrow in flight to address a scenario where motion is continuous but where time consists of instants. If the arrow's movement consists of it being in different positions at different instants of time, then the arrow is not really moving because no time elapses in these instants of time. So this claim that motion is impossible is based on the idea that motion is continuous by definition. So what Zeno was really doing was showing that continuous motion was impossible where strong emphasis should be placed on the word continuous. In summary, Zeno's argument was this. Motion is continuous. Continuous motion leads to absurdity. Therefore, motion is not possible. But another Greek philosopher, Democritus, interpreted Zeno's paradoxes as follows. Continuous motion leads to absurdity. We know motion is possible. Therefore the problem is with continuous. And so motion must occur but as a series of smallest units of time and smallest units of distance or what we might now call a series of Planck times and Planck lengths. Effectively, Democritus provided a solution to Zeno's paradoxes. All we need to do is accept that infinite divisibility is a flawed concept. Democritus believed that if nothing could be continuous, then everything must consist of a finite number of indivisible parts, which the ancient Greeks called atoms. And this belief was called atomism. The wider implication is that everything must consist of smallest parts, including any movement, regardless of whether it's real or imagined, has to consist of a series of parts just like the frames of a video or film. Time must consist of a series of smallest parts. There must be smallest parts of matter. Space itself must be granular. The same goes for length. Any real or imagined geometric shapes. And anything you can think of, even if that thing is supposed to be continuous. It's very difficult to imagine empty space as consisting of indivisible parts because we naturally imagine there's a measurable distance between them. But the distance between two parts of space must be measured in terms of parts of space. So the measurement could be the smallest number of spaces we can travel through to get from one to the other. Many people consider Democritus to be the father of modern science, as he believed in acquiring knowledge from studying the natural world and the study of things in the natural world is called physics. 
On the other side of the fence we have Plato, who completely disagreed with Democritus. He believed we acquire knowledge from a realm beyond the natural world, and the study of other worldly things is called metaphysics. Like today's mathematicians, Plato accepted that perfect circles and perfect straight lines probably can't exist in physical reality. And like today's mathematicians, Plato believed we could imagine these things, although today people don't even question how a finite brain can supposedly achieve this imagining of the infinite, whereas Plato suggested that we somehow connect to a third realm through what he called the second realm of consciousness. His theory of non-physical forms or ideas became known as Platonism. This kind of belief that non-physical things can somehow exist is called metaphysical belief because in ancient Greece metaphysics literally meant over and beyond physics. But can we really imagine perfect forms or are we deluding ourselves? Can we really imagine perfect shapes whose edges are genuinely continuous and thus infinitely divisible? Or must all lengths be a finite amount of smallest parts or plank lengths? In ancient times it was undeniable that the gods were perfect. And so we can appreciate why Plato might have come up with his ideas about different realms. The battle about where knowledge comes from became the battle for the foundation of modern day mathematics. On one side of the fence we had Democritus supporting physical reality. On the other side we had Plato who preferred a foundation based on the mysticism of metaphysics. Physics is restricted to only things that can or could exist in the real world. Whereas metaphysics is not restricted and so can include abstract things that are beautiful and perfect. Physics can't avoid undesirable conclusions like having to reject the infinite. Whereas metaphysics can easily accommodate infinity by simply rejecting any argument against it. Democritus didn't promote his ideas as well as Plato did. Plato founded a large academy that was the start of all academia and to this very day in the academic subject of mathematics it is mandatory that you accept a platonic belief in abstract objects and that you can conceive of the infinite and so Plato clearly won the battle. The ancient Greeks were still very wary of infinity and Aristotle tried to make a distinction between two different kinds of infinity. He described an actual infinity as a completed infinity and a potential infinity as one that is never completed but where elements can always be added. This potential infinity was devised in order to avoid the problematic nature of an actual infinity. One criticism of this approach is that in order for a potential infinity to exist we must first assume that the ability to keep adding will persist forever where the word forever implies an actual infinity. And so this concept of a potential infinity is just a slippery way of disguising an actual infinity. The basis of mathematics was firmly established by Euclid in his publication called Euclid's Elements. And even though Euclid didn't like infinity, he still defined a point in terms that meant it was infinitely small, and he defined a line in a way that meant it was infinitely thin. At least the ancient Greeks tried to define these fundamental concepts. Nowadays we avoid the problematic nature of defining these things by calling them primitive notions. Instead of admitting that these things are unimaginable and don't make any sense, we pretend they are so primitive that we all understand them and that no definition is necessary. And that brings us to the end of our story about infinity in ancient Greece.